Well, our next speaker is Chris, Chris Walsh. Uh, he's going to be speaking on controlling vigor in apple trees. He's Professor Emeritus with us. Um, he's done a ton of work here at the Y with apple trees, and I'll let you have it from here. My topic is going to be something that has vexed me for, I grew apples in Vermont back before many of you were born, and I moved south. I went to elementary school, middle school, and high school in, in Bethesda, and then I moved away for 15 years and worked in Vermont for a while after I went to college, and then I went to Cornell, and I came back here and I was amazed by how much apple trees in general and fruit, uh, fruit trees in general and apple trees in particular would grow in this climate. And so what I'm going to try to do is put together my thoughts about something as to why it's so difficult to control vigor in fruit trees in this area. And I'm going to try to write so you can see it, and we'll see. I'm going to wind up with an equation, and the equation's going to be, it's going to come up with vigor, which you might translate as to how much pruning do I have to do, tree size, or perhaps even profitability, okay? And I'm going to start with the differences uh, in our environment. And then I'm going to multiply this, or yeah, let's multiply it, all right, by how you choose to manage the trees. And this would work just as well for apples as it would for peaches. I'm curious to know, how many of you grow peaches but not apples? How many of you grow apples and peaches? How many of you don't want to raise your hand because you just don't want to play along? <laughs> All right, Apple, management, and then the final thing is genetics. And most of the time we think about genetics first, but I'm going to leave that till the end, all right? So Kurt talked about weeds and soil. Environment, we're dealing with climate, and we're dealing with essentially soil fertility, all right? Management, what are you doing as far as your system? And what are you doing with plant growth regulators? And then the thing that everyone thinks about when they think about tree vigor is essentially rootstocks and sign varieties, all right? I'm going to do this talk, as I said, in three pieces. I'm going to do some on the chalkboard. The second piece is going to be, I'm going to give you a very small fraction of a decade-long trial that we did here at Y on Fuji apple variety on a whole bunch of different size controlling rootstocks. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about our breeding program to try to reduce pruning needs by changing the signs rather than the sign varieties and doing something with them. So this is what I'd you know, sort of like, to, like you to think about. And I'm going to walk through each one of these piece by piece. So we're going to start first on the left side of the equation. And we're going to talk a little bit about the environment. All right? Now, when I worked in New York and Vermont, they talked about apple growth being, if you had the right level of fertilizer, they talked about apple growth being 12 to 18 inches a year. How many of you can keep, honestly and truly, can keep apple growth that low? Probably pretty difficult. And as the trees get older and larger, you're probably dealing with somewhere between uh, greater than 12 inches and possibly going up into 30 inches, all right? In this climate, if you just grow peaches here, we get the same kind of growth at this location in peaches that my friends in South Carolina grew when we were doing peach rootstock trials here and all over the country. And if you, you can get 
yards of peach tree growth in this growing season, all right? So we're dealing with something that's a whole lot bigger, all right? And we deal with the, that shoot. Why does it get bigger? Well, the trees, if you, take, if you think about what the tree does, what one leaf does in the year, or what all the leaves do, and you make a pie chart. Now that pie chart is, where does all the photosynthate go in the tree? All right. Now, most of it's going to go to vegetative growth, and some of it's going to go to fruit growth. All right. Now, how many of you grow galas? OK. When do you pick galas over here? Uh, early August. Early August, August 10th? Yeah. Good day. OK. I would say August 10th here, August 20th uh, for folks on the other side of the bay in the Piedmont. All right. So if the leaves on the tree, and we're going to make this a, a longer shoot because it's going to be a shoot grown in over here. OK, so we got a whole bunch of leaves on the tree. All right. Now, when do your leaves drop? When do your apple leaves drop? Christmas? Yeah. OK. They're green. They're green past Thanksgiving and up. Most years. Yeah. Do you even go below 50 degrees in September? No. No. Rarely. Rarely. OK. So these leaves, oh, that's a bad looking leaf, all right? But let's say we're going to pick galas on August 10th, all right? Now, once you pick those galas, you got this pie chart, but then the leaves aren't doing anything for the fruit, so they're just putting on lumber. And that's one of the biggest problems we have this far south growing trees is they keep growing from harvest period, let's say, August 10th until about November 30th. Right? And even a sunny day in December, even at Cornell Geneva, Alan Laxer told me they could measure 50% of the photosynthetic rate in December up that far north. So there's an awful lot of stuff. And what happens is the vegetative growth in that period after harvest is going to go for trunk, <coughs> diameter, and we did a study many years ago where we tried to figure out with peach trees. I never did this with apples, but it's the same kind of thing. Somebody else has done it. And we measured the, the weight of the tree. We dug them up. We dug red haven trees up every couple of months during the growing season. We dried all the lumber down. We dried the fruit. We dried the leaves. We dried everything. And the roots, really the root period of growth is after harvest to the end of the growing season. So you wind up putting all of this added vegetative growth that used to be growing. Where does it go? It takes the tree about two weeks to recover from getting the crop off, but then it puts it into trunk and it puts it into roots, all right? If you got more trunk and you got more roots, you got more reserves to be able to grow the following year. So we're fighting a battle constantly at this climate, which is once we take this part of the pie chart away, where there's no more fruit, then we're going to be growing more trunk and more diameter. And one of the things I've seen lately is people who have intensive plantings, I'm seeing massive trunks on the trees. Where are they getting that trunks from? Where's Chris? He asked me about pruning, all right? He's on the way. OK. I, I, I want to I ask him a question, that's all. All right. Um, 
I was, I was visiting an orchard a couple weeks ago, um, no, a couple months ago, and I was looking at 10 year old trees and they're on size controlling rootstocks. How big are the trunks at sort of chest height in that Fuji planting out there? They're probably somewhere in there. I'd Four to five inches in diameter. And how far apart are those trees? Two feet. Yeah, Two yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's an awful lot of lumber you're putting on because you asked me about pruning. Once we get the fruit off, or if we don't have a heavy crop, all of that was supposed to go to the fruit, winds up going to the roots and the trunk, and you just get them bigger and bigger. And they're really hard to control. Mm -hmm. All right, so anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, so. That's the first thing. The second thing is soil. And Kurt was talking about you know, different things you can do in perennial mulching. And, and uh, one of the things is you, know, you, can, you can either use herbicides. In peaches, we learned long ago, Mike Lenn did a great study where he killed sod and planted peach trees in it. And it was quite clear that we all know intuitively that peaches don't do very well if you're growing them in sod. Apples, they're not just living in the herbicide strip or under the mulch if you've got a mulched operation. They'll go under the grass and they'll be able to pull water up from under the grass. So it's very hard to, even if you intensify apple plantings, uh, what did I do with this one here? The blue ones. We, got, we got the soil here. Um, apples will, if you have an apple tree right here and you have sod out here, the roots will go under the sod and they'll keep pulling fertilizer and they'll keep pu pulling water up. And so we've got a second problem, which is as we get those monstrous rainfalls in August and September, we have a tremendous ability to regrow the trees. And sometimes you, you just get a short flush of growth. Sometimes you can get a quite, quite a bit of growth. Okay, so that's environment. <sighs> Second is management. All right. All right. And we think about pruning. The first things that come to mind, training. And frank growth regulators, right? Pruning, if you want to reduce vigor, dormant pruning is an invigorating dwarfing process. What do I mean by that? When you make a cut, you invigorate the side of the cut you get new shoots growing. You make a cut, you got crow's feet of shoots growing, all right? The dwarfing process is you have removed potential photosynthetic area, so you essentially reduce the size of the throat. Pruning is much greater than, uh, dormant pruning is much greater uh, effect on invigoration than summer pruning. The problem is none of us want to do summer pruning, right? So one of the things we're seeing more and more people do is do a mechanical hedging just of the current season's shoots. So you take off some of the tip back, two things happen. One is you're removing photosynthetic canopy. The other one is you are getting more light into where the fruit is actually, so you get better color. So uh, dormant is much greater a shoot uh, shoot growth. So the, the essentially dormant is going to give you greater growth than summer pruning. Okay, did I say that? So people are following me? You all know this, right? It's intuitive, all right. The last thing is training. We've moved more and more to trying to train trees so that you have two kinds of cuts. Heading and thinning, right? Heading cuts are much more 
stimulative of growth than thinning out cuts. A great example of this is the power company that did my street yesterday. They came through, and instead of doing what they were supposed to do, which is to prune one on one side of the line and one on the other side of the line, they just went right through and cut it off very neatly at, uh, above the, uh, the line for Comcast, but below the electric line. So, uh, no, Pepco. Pepco. They're, yeah. they're trained not to do that. I know they're trained not to they do it. It must be a contractor. It's a contractor. Yeah, it's a contractor. All right. So heading cuts are much more stimulatory than thinning out cuts. Thinning out cuts would be where you have two branches and you take one of them out. Heading cuts would be where you take both branches and cut them in a third or in a half. Prank growth regulators. I don't think we have this for peaches, but uh, a lot of people use, um, get ahead of myself here. Am I doing anything right? There we go. Mm. One of the things that makes a plant hormone that really leads to growth is vegetative growth is gibberellin, right? You have plants that are short growth, like they might be a rosette form, and then they bolt. That tends to be a gibberellin response in the rosette plants. Uh, we have uh, apogee, which most people use as a way of putting terminal buds on an apple tree. And why, do, why did we get into doing that? Because the vegetative shoot is susceptible to a bacterial disease called fire blight. And so the idea is, as soon as you get that terminal bud set, fire blight susceptibility drops off. When we went from red delicious and golden delicious in our orchards, end of 1980s, early 1990s, and went to Gala, Fuji, Honeycrisp, we picked three fire blight susceptible varieties. And so one of the solutions to that is essentially applying Apogee, and what it does is it reduces the amount of gibberellin, which instead of the shoot continuing to grow, it winds up putting on a terminal bud uh, so you wind up creating a terminal blood growth. Oh, did I lose you? No, no, I'm... Where's my cameraman back there? We got sound? It fell off? Okay. How am I doing on time, Kathy? Taking too much time? 15 minutes? All right, I can't get this thing back on. There we go. All right, so then the third thing is what most people think about when they're thinking about controlling vigor in fruit trees, and that is genetics. And and I'm going to divide that into two pieces. And I'll finally get back to PowerPoint to do the last piece, which is root stock. Could you pass out that, that uh, and give me a copy? Now, what Kathy's going to pass out is something that I worked up this week because I wasn't really thinking about it. But it's a little bit from the Fuji Apple study that um, we wound up doing here. And, uh, if you just stick with me on the first page while she passes it out. Um, we, this is just something I pulled together in the last couple of days when I realized I had to cover a little bit more than I expected. We had a, I was meeting with Gennaro Fazio at an NC140 meeting. And Gennaro is the rootstock breeder yeah, you all immediately go to the second page. I'm sorry about that. Please try to stay on the first page before I explain the second page. Um, I was talking with Gennaro about fire blight and apples. And one of the big problems we had with fire blight and apples is uh, many of the rootstocks that are non-Geneva stocks are very susceptible to 
uh, fire blight infection. So I, it was about 10 years ago, and I was talking with Gennaro in a meeting, and I said, well, if you send us some apple trees, um, we'll kill them. We'll bring them down to Y, and we'll kill them. We'll see what, what your rootstocks can actually do. So uh, Gennaro Fazio breeds Geneva rootstocks, Cornell Geneva, and he sent 15 selections of his advanced material, and I've excerpted some of that for this presentation, along with Mauling 9. Mauling 9 is the sort of benchmark of the dwarf rootstock that a lot of people were growing, but even folks who grow Mauling 9 here say it grows too vigorously. So uh, we had an outbreak of fire blight in Maryland, and that killed a fair number of trees. And it not only was fire blight in the sign varieties, but it, what Paul Steiner taught me years ago is fire blight moves asymptomatically from where you see the strike, and it moves all the way down. And if you have a susceptible rootstock underneath it, it'll kill the rootstock. And so that's where we got a fair, fair number of losses, all right? We, I think we have six years worth of data on this. And we terminated the study right at the beginning of COVID. So it was about March 2020. And we had six years of data, which included tree size, yield, annual leave per tree of these 16 different rootstocks, all BC2 Fuji, size of the trunks. And then you calculate from the yield, you can calculate long-term efficiency, which is how much fruit yield is over the size of the trunk to sort of put them all into the same uh, who's more productive and who's more precocious. The last thing we did, once I told Mike, I said, well, growers are having a lot of problems with wind. Again, when we look at the environment, it's wetter, warmer, and windier. Right? These are the three things we're dealing with. Some people have had trellises go down. Uh, we did a tour in Winchester, uh, Kathy and I organized a tour in Winchester, how long ago was that, four or five years, five years ago? COVID. <laughs> yeah, pre-COVID. And one of the growers we visited had lost a hundred and some trees to wind. He was in a valley in Winchester and the wind would come across the valley, they didn't have a windbreak and it would just snap them right off. So we called him up what was it, two weeks after the, the tour? They'd lost 120 of their young trees at the time of the tour. I said, How's, how was it in the windstorm? He said, well, we lost another 400. And so you can either lose freestanding trees or freestanding individually supported trees, or you, know, you can take a whole trellis down. And those are the problems we had. So I asked Mike Newell to, before he left, this happened right as they were shutting the university down for COVID, I said, let's find out what it takes to pull each of these trees over. So individually, he hooked it to the front end loader of a John Deere, a come along. Is that what you call them down here in the south? All right, I don't know, that's what, I, that's what we call them, a come along, all right? So they measured the pull force on the come along to when the tree either snapped off completely or just kind of popped out of the soil. So it was just a rough sort of simple thing, but we wanted to get, wound up getting the torque. So we got two tables on the next page. For those of you who listened to me and didn't turn the page over, uh, we had 16 rootstocks in this. I've given you six that you might know the numbers of, right? And in the t first table, why do we have survival as a fraction? Well, we started out with 10 trees. We were supposed to take five to Keatesville and do five here. Uh, we lost a number of trees, uh, some went to Keatesville, but Mike only planted four to five, four, three, four or five, depending on what they had for rootstocks. I've given you six rootstocks in the left column because 210, 969 and 935 are semi-dwarf trees that Geneva has patented, all right? Then next to them, I gave you three numbers, M9337, which is the standard mauling nine rootstock. We did not have the super dwarf sort of bud nine in this study. Uh, and I got a couple of uh, things that look like good candidates uh, that are one that's about the same size as uh, mauling nine, the other one which is uh, quite a bit smaller, uh, and those three. Counted the suckers, that's the second column. The height, they were all at the same trellis. Some of them were way over the trellis, some of them weren't. So that's why the height's a little bit different, but they were all essentially a 12 foot trellis. And then trunk diameter, all right? 
Trunk diameter is where the dry matter of the tree, where does the photosynthate go that's going to be reserves for the following year? And as you go down that 210, 969, 935, trunk diameter gets a little bit smaller. Semi-dwarf trees, those are the ones that if you wanted to plant trees at a, let's say, 12 by 20 spacing, if that was the kind of spacing that your tractor worked for, those would be your choices for that. Uh, why did we lose one out of four trees? That was the 2012 fire blight epidemic, primarily. Uh, dwarf trees, we have the, essentially the litmus test, which is mauling nine. We have one that was uh, about the same size, uh, which is 5257, uh, and then 4003, uh, a little bit smaller. So they're, they're all sitting around uh, uh, the uh, mauling nine size tree, and, and those are it. If you go down to the second table, what I want to call your attention to is something that it's a duh moment, but it's still kind of interesting. If you go to the final column on the far side and look at the, the second to the last and the last column, efficiency is how many pounds or how many kilograms of fruit do you get over the same size trunk? So the efficiency puts them all based on how much tonnage of fruit is going off, how much lumber. Agronomic crops talk about harvest index. It's how much grain is coming versus how much stock of plant there is. If they dry weight the, the plant, well, we can't dry weight trees every year. So what we do is we use the concept of efficiency to look about how productive and how precocious things are. The thing I want to call your attention to on efficiency is that bottom line 4003, which is super dwarf. For those of you who know apple rootstocks, I think this is probably the closest thing from Geneva to resemble bud nine. That's my feeling. And it's got that whopping amount of efficiency. I don't know where it came from. Uh, what the, uh, if you go up to mauling nine on the first table, we lost two out of four trees. That's fire blight, that's rootstock blight, okay? If we go down to the bottom table, the pull force, the semi-dwarf trees had better anchorage, right? So they could be supported, but they're too darn big, all right? When you go to, I, I was just amazed by the pull force on 5257, which I believe all four trees survived, uh, had a decent sized trunk, slightly smaller than Mauling 9 from table one, but it was one of the, uh, of what's the ones, it's not the biggest one in the entire study, but it's darn good. And uh, 5257 and 4003, I don't know where Gennaro is on these, but I know that he, called, um, he's talking about something that's a super dwarf, which I think is one of these two. Uh, but then the efficiency, you look at mauling nine, that's why people planted so much of it, but you look at the efficiencies of 52, 57 kilograms per centimeter squared, that's essentially the equivalent of pounds per square inch, although I didn't calculate it out on that, but it would be the same thing. By the way, uh, 15 kilograms on yield is three quarters of a bushel, uh, 20 kilograms of yield is essentially a bushel per tree per year over six years. And we were growing them, I think, at five by, what are they, five by 12 out there, five by 14? Not sure. Okay, I, I can't remember, and I didn't look it up, I'm sorry. But it's a tight planting, all right? This is the second piece I wanted to talk about. Any questions about this? I mean, this is a, de a decade-long study. We got the plants. They look like grape cuttings, bare root, uh, bench grafted, two buds into a, root, into a root stock. So they look like the way you'd buy a, a grape uh, plant. Uh, Mike grew them in container for one year, then we put the containers into the field. So we had um, a nice long time. Let's, let's go with the, sli uh, the slides and uh, I'll do the last thing. But any questions on what I've said so far? while we while we wait for the decking, all right? Um, Gennaro may have better results on this because he's doing a whopping computer analysis that takes in fertility, but I think it's really cool. Yeah? So not all of the Geneva rootstocks are fire blight resistant. Are these two? They're all supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you could see we lost trees. Yeah. And we didn't, Gennaro wanted us to plant them as just the little two, bench graft seedlings immediately. I said, they'll never survive at all. So I wanted to get them in. I think it was the second or third leaf was the fire blight epidemic year. 
so they'd really grown like corn the previous year. And one of our problems is, you know, how do you stop them from growing? And Mike did not use Apogee. So, but only a few of them did we get 100% survival. And this is a pretty good, no, there's no winter injury here. You all have this. Right. They did, a, they did way more than I expected on the PowerPoint, but you can take it home with you and enjoy it, right? Um, they're supposed to all be f field tolerant to North American diseases, Phytophthora and fire, blight, and, and fire blight, but I don't believe it. Um, and that's why I took him down here, because he said he wanted a, a reading on fire blight tolerance, and so we took him. I think he's also given some to Bob Black over the years, but I don't know if Bob actually takes any data on them. And the ones that went to Keatesville um, were not as, they were a little bit more, we didn't have a real match planning for up there. So this is really the only site that we really got the data on. But Gennaro is working really hard on the data because it turned out that we had four blocks, two rows, and one of the rows had been in sod while the other row had been in veg crops. So we actually had blocks one and two significantly different than block three and four as far as vigor. So he's gone back and reanalyzed everything based on uh, phosphorus and potassium levels in the leaves. We took it, every single tree, every single photograph of every single tree. That was, I guess, right before COVID happened. But pulling them out was really instructive. Mike Newell had a 20 second video of just kind of pulling in some of them. They just went right over. So I think that even if they were healthy, there was a lot of root damage underneath them. Other questions? I don't know what the problem is, but who sent them last week? He sent them the, the PowerPoints, but I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out where it's hiding on this page. Um, so the third thing I want to talk about is, over there I talked about genetics. And I debuted, that was rootstock. What we just talked about was rootstock, okay? We can make the trees smaller. We can shift that pie slice more towards fruit by essentially having semi-dwarf and dwarf trees. We can increase that pie slice that's going to the fruit. The problem with that is if you take it too far, the anchorage is lost because no dry matter is getting to the roots. And when I talked about, you know, if you don't have as much foliage, you can't get it down to the roots. The roots aren't growing and you lose anchorage. And I think that's one of the reasons we're having a lot of problems. The other problem we're having with uh, some of the new varieties on new rootstocks is um, we don't know whether it's sign wood that's not virus protected or whether it's true incompatibilities. But we have a lot of, we've seen a lot of trees blow out right at the union where they snap. Now the old one, the old problem we had with that, many of you may remember mulling, Merton Mulling 106 as a rootstock. Uh, that was a problem because they had a uh, decline where the rootstock would snap off with tomato ring spot virus. We had um, I, Geneva 41, which was really supposed to be the replacement for mulling nine five or six years ago. We had a match planning of Gala and Crips Pink on Geneva 41, uh, we lost 50% of the trees on G41 because uh, they snapped off at the Union. And the other thing that uh, I didn't notice, but Brian noticed it, was the suckers that would come up would also be brittle. And so uh, it's not just a brittle Union, but it's also the actual the lumber being brittle. I'm sorry to hold this up here, but I have no idea where they hid my PowerPoint, they did a gorgeous job of giving it to you, but let me, let me have one and I'll just work it, all right? So what I'm gonna talk about is something that we've been involved with for a long time. Started in 1991 and I call it the Apple Tree Architecture Project. And uh, I got three names on it, Kathy's the third one, Julia Harshman, who some of you know who was who got a graduate degree with me and then went on to get a fruit breeding degree at Washington State. And now she breeds, of all things, celery. Who knew that people bred celery for a living? But she breeds celery for a living for Duda Farms. 
If you go to the second, and it's front to back here, so if you go to the second one, I've seen in my career tremendous changes in, in what apple orchards look like. When I was pruning fruit trees in Vermont in 1970, we had trees that were on 30 by 30 foot spacing, <clears throat> and we had widow maker ladders and we went up to the tops of the trees and when we fell out luckily there was enough snow on the ground that we didn't really get hurt so uh, it wasn't too bad but this is a shot that I took uh, I think it's up around Sotus in upstate New York all right now we've gone through this by having a series of rootstocks and I've alluded to mauling nine and a couple of the other ones uh, the thing that's going to come out on this picture right here uh, I took out of an Adams County nursery catalog maybe 10 or 15 years ago, all right? I did not do that myself. Um, so, you know, this, this is, I, I went to the chalkboard for a while, as I told you, so that's why I came back. So, um, Merton Mauling 111 is a clonal rootstock, but essentially non-dwarfing. Uh, Mauling 9 is the one that was the uh, control, I guess you would say, or the, the typical benchmark uh, in that Fuji trial we talked about. Budogovsky 9, the only thing they have in common is the number 9. They are not genetically related, but it is actually something that's actually more dwarfing than Mauling 9. So those are the things that uh, allowed us to intensify apple orchards. And many plant people are doing this, all right? They're doing something called the tall spindle planting. And uh, did you go to dwarf fruit tree this year or last year, Lynn? Last year. I, fruit Tree Association, all right, you got, you got tall spindle to <laughs> by uh, Gennaro and Terrence. Um, one problem I didn't bring, excellent. Uh, we go down two or three more. Um, next, next, next one. Oh. All right. Uh, keep going down one more, all right? Okay, uh, tall spindle trees, we hope that we're gonna be able to have root competition. The problem is in our climate, I think what's happening with tall spindle trees is the roots get out from under the herbicide strip and they're not just competing with each other but they're actually going under the turf. One thing I didn't bring up when I was talking about environment was soil and the water penetration. And I think, you know, if you were dealing with peaches, the roots are all gonna stay in that herbicide strip. Uh, this is a shot up around Geneva, New York, that I took many, many years ago, all right now. Uh, they can count on, they can count on the root competition under the trees, but I'm not sure we get that here. All right? I'm not sure we get that here. So we've had historical problems. Does that work? Is it not working? No, it goes. OK. This is, you know, in my lifetime, in the 50 plus years I've been involved with apples, you know, we started out with Merton mauling stocks. That was clonal but not dwarfing. It's, what's WAA stand for? That's woolly apple aphid. They were bred for use in Australia and New Zealand where woolly apple aphid is just a major problem. It's an introduced pest. And so that's where they were bred. So that was actually, uh, I forget what the mauling clone was, but it was bred against Northern Spy. Northern Spy is a North American variety. It's tolerant to woolly apple aphid. The problem is that it's non-dwarfing and non-precocious. So we went from 111 to 106 to, and then trees started snapping off. So we didn't know much about mauling seven. So we went from 106 to mauling seven because that was supposed to be smaller. That was, the tr that was the variety that tended to lean. It had a shallow root system and they tended to lean. So you had to put a small stake next to it. So then we wanted, we wanted to make the trees a little bit smaller. So we went to mauling 26, which was the smallest quote semi-dwarf that was available. Problem with that, it's very susceptible to uh, fire blight. Anybody have any M26s left in their orchards? You do? How big are they? 12 feet. 12 feet? How big are their trunks? 12 to 14 inches. Yeah. They got a lot of lumber, right? Yeah, yeah. 
So they're, they're not really a pedestrian orchard anymore, I would guess. OK, all right. So um, Paul Steiner, we were going into Fuji and Gala in the early 1990s. And we were trying to put them on Malling 9 to make them sm the trees smaller because 26 was too big in this climate. We found out that fire blight can move asymptomatically and kills the trees, which is why two out of the four trees died in our Fuji study here. Now we're planting, growers are planting a lot of Budogovsky 9. As I said before, those two don't have anything in common except the number 9. They're not genetically related that I'm aware of. They are more susceptible to fire blight than we would like them to be, but they slow down the growth really fast. They do require trellises. Uh, G11 and G41 are supposed to be fire blight tolerant, if not resistant. Uh, they also require trellises. So that's kind of where this is what we've done, and we're probably what I was talking to you about the, on the Fuji study would be a whole other line that's under here, which is a, another generation from the Geneva breeding program. Mm -hmm. I decided a long time ago that with apple breeding programs being in New York, Ontario, Minnesota, and Washington State, they're all states bordering or in Canada, cold climates, all right? And with our long growing season, I really wanted to do stuff that was high quality fruit that would take the heat. I was particularly interested in fire blight because I listened to Jim Cummins when I was on the program with him in Yakima, Washington in the early 1990s. And he says, if you change the variety from red and gold and delicious and put it on a size, on a size controlling rootstock, you're going to get fire blight problems. And Jim, Jim was uh, really uh, pre prescient in that. So I was interested in trying to figure out a way to get field tolerance to fire blight look, while simultaneously looking for precocity and productivity. After 30 some years, we're actually getting a couple things patented that hopefully have what I call sign dwarfing, which is the dwarfism doesn't have to only be in the rootstock, you can also put it into the sign. Uh, this is a shot, I don't know if you can see this one or not. Do we have too much house light in here? Can you, can you shut down one of the house lights? Pardon? There we go. All right. Um, I was in, at Cornell Geneva in 2008. This is out of our seedling field in 2008. Julie and I came back from an uh, international fruit tree meeting in Geneva, and we'd had two hailstorms that year. And hail, the Irwinia, the hail organism, uh, the fire blight organism, is around year round. It can't penetrate bark, but if you get hail, you're essentially inoculating the tree. So it's just like if you get a cut, you have to use something on that cut so you don't get a, uh, something inside your body that might give you a big infection. So these are infections that came uh, not from blossom blight, but from hail uh, in, uh, th during the growing season. And this was just a row, I think it's a row of seedling trees, uh, Crips Pink. Everything in that orchard that had more than 10 strikes, we removed. So our breeding material uh, for the second generation were trees that looked like this after the hailstorm rather than look like that. Now, don't ask me, well, did the hail just hit that tree and didn't hit that one? It didn't work that way. It was all through the entire planting. So we found some genetic, where did it come from? I had used Macintosh Widget, which is patented as dwarf Macintosh to be able to have a smaller tree and uh, genetically uh, sign dwarf tree. So we've got second generation seedlings. Uh, Julie and I uh, released a 101, which is Antietam Blush. That's got a patent. Unfortunately, it's more vigorous than I would like, and it hasn't gone anywhere because Honeycrisp and all the ch children of Honeycrisp, uh, when I was encouraged to propagate this one, it was because of flavor for local production, but uh, it just got swallowed up by the Honeycrisp thing. Uh, Elite, uh, Lynn, that's the one I asked you one time, what would you prune on that tree, 610? That, that, that's a wild type uh, Elite tree. Then we have a series of sign dwarf trees, and I'll talk about three of them. Uh, Y190, which was actually came out of here, uh, we've got a patent on that one. Well, it's pending, but we've been told we've got it. Uh, 227, which is turning out to be a good parent uh, for the third generation, and uh, F333. 
Uh, F, uh, CP means the seed parent is Crips Pink. This one, the seed parent is Fuji. Seed parent for Y190 is a co-op ver co variety, which is Gold Rush. All right. Now, what do I mean by sign dwarfing, all right? This row, these are all on Merton Mulling 11 rootstock. So we have three grafted trees. Uh, these were all done by my friend Vic Priapi, who owned, owned Priapi Landscaping, which is in, you say, he just said he was in Cecilton, right? Uh, he used to work for Angelica, and then he went to Cecilton. Um, so these were, these were uh, some of the sign dwarf trees on two, uh, 111 rootstock. This is a wild type tree, 610, same rootstock, same spacing, and neither tree has ever been pruned. Uh, I don't prune anything in our breeding fields because I want to do as little pruning as possible, and we're trying to select things that'll look good uh, with pruning. I just want to call your attention to it. That's the rootstock we've got them on, Merton Mauling 111. So, all of this smaller tree is coming from dwarfism in the sign, not from a different rootstock. So here's Y190. Uh, we got a three step, step ladder, and I picked this tree. Uh, it's fairly large fruit. It comes in about September 20th. Uh, I would say, what's that, autumn, bl uh, autumn blush? Autumn crisp? It's about, it's about the same size, as, uh, same season as Autumn Crisp. At Kittiesville, they're a good three, three and a quarter inch apple. Um, and these trees have never been pruned, again, on 111 rootstock. Uh, the Y, <laughs> that, <laughs> it, it's, it, ha it has a history as to, but it, you might as well read it as um, WYE, Y190. It was, that was the location out in the breeding field here. Uh, where we had seedlings of Brayburn and Gold Rush many, many years ago. Uh, it's gone now. F333 is one that I think is really exciting because you can, it's almost a Fuji. It's, a, it's, a, it's got Fuji as a seed parent. It has sign dwarfing. This is, again, the three-foot, uh, four-step ladder. Uh, you can, what it does that I like is it gets weight on the fruit and the, the shoots bend over. So both of these uh, this one, you can't quite see it as much here, but you can see some of the shoots. They actually bend over on the weight. Some of the trees are very much erect and upright, uh, like 227 was, I showed you there. But this one, the stuff actually bends over. Uh, 333 is the same way. I sort of thought 333 picked around the first week of uh, October, uh, sort of in Aztec Fuji season. Uh, we didn't get any at that time of year, but then we were, at, Kathy, you and I were at Keatesville, what, like election day or something like that, in November? And I brought them back and they had water core in them. And uh, I was amazed they were up around, f a pick your own person who's interested in water core fruit, which is very much the Asian American market, uh, would be happy to think they were buying Fuji's with this one. It's really quite nice. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is we're not done yet. Uh, we're working on a third generation seedling evaluated. We have uh, children of uh, the wild types. Uh, we have children of the sign dwarfing. And then essentially CP227, uh, we're very interested in that one. And uh, this, I'll just show you pictures of stuff that we do in the lab. And uh, here we got some shoots. I don't know where I was standing to get this photograph, but at any rate, uh, we just kind of line them out like that and have a look at weight and quality and things like that. Um, 227, which is this sort of erect one that we're not gonna register because it doesn't weigh itself down, it just goes up. Uh, and you have a hard, you got a tight canopy there, it's hard to deal with. It's turned out to throw some really good fruit. This is one uh, that I really liked. I think this is 20, 2020 or 2021, uh, yeah, 2021, but uh, that's the end of October, which would fit, fit in with a, probably the last, it's a little bit earlier than Crips Pink by a couple of weeks. This was 1021, looks very much like uh, Cosmic Crisp. It's a nice crisp one. And what are we doing? What I learned is if I just do all this work and don't do any work afterwards to market it, it's not going anywhere. So we've really ramped up our abilities to try to get nurseries involved. 
Uh, I've sent Budwood on a materials transfer agreement to Michigan State, and we're working on one with Texas A&M uh, because Texas is interested because of the heat tolerance. Michigan State, they're growing into the grower trials that um, uh, Michigan State faculty has at three or four different locations. Uh, we've talked with home grounds people. Uh, we've talked with commercial orchards. We have uh, licenses with Adams County and Cummins Nursery for Antietam Blush. Uh, the bottom line is what I'd really like to do is be able to have enough dwarfism in the sign that we could throw the rootstock away and you'd be able to buy something that you could put out in a water wheel vegetable transplanter. Uh, hopefully I can get that done in the next decade or less. And there's Julia. 2008, I think, or maybe 2009. Thank you very much for your attention. I don't know if I've gone over. Yes, I have gone over. Yeah, you right you frightened me that I was going to have to do 45 minutes. So. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Usually we can definitely part of the questions. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll take questions. And yeah, you've got still have time. I do? OK. All right. I've, I've taken some. Any questions from my apple growers out there? You're using all northern growers to test your new material, nothing from Winchester, Virginia, or um, North Carolina? Or well, no, that's why I, 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 t I have a really good friend who's department chair in horticulture at Texas A&M. And he was in the lab uh, in September. He really liked one of the seedlings of Antietam Blush. He also liked 333 and, and 190. So we're trying to do a materials transfer agreement with Texas A&M. They're doing four sites all over Texas for cider orchards. And he wants to put them in as pollinizers in hard cider orchards, because like everywhere else, cider is booming in Texas. Uh, and they just love everything if it's from Texas. So I'm trying to do that. So Michigan was one thing. Why did I go with Michigan? They don't have a breeding program. And so I was really interested in getting an honest readout from Michigan State, where Cornell, Washington State, I'm not going to, they got their own things to Huckster. So I thought Michigan would be good. I thought Texas would be good because of the heat and the disease, looking for heat and diseases. And the other thing is, I believe we can get, we're hoping that we can get uh, Texas A&M to put some grad students on it to see if they can run them out in tissue culture so they'd be micro-propagated. You buy blueberry plants, right, Merle? Yeah. Are they, uh, are they, uh, Standard propagation, or are they micro-propagated? Do you remember? Standard. Standard, OK, because some, some of them do do tissue culture. I know some of the Michigan labs do it. I've also talked with other people about doing a Spanish company and some other stuff. So um, I'm trying to do more. And we've been involved with, Kathy and I have been involved with what's called a National Science Foundation i which is really understanding your markets better. And I realized that the business to business of the fruit breeding has to be to the nurseries, not to you people directly, unfortunately. You can't buy it if I can't get it into the nursery. So when we were up in Hershey, what, three weeks ago, I talked with um, Saunders Brothers, who's gotten into the fruit tree propagation. I mean, they're, they're an absolutely huge Home Depot supplier for, when I was down and saw Paul Saunders many years ago, I think he had 220 hoop houses at that point doing ornamentals. Uh, I don't know how many they've got now, but um, I knew I've done stuff with them ever since I talked to him about growing galas in the 1980s. And uh, he planted 20,000 trees, which kind of shocked the hell out of me. But at any rate, he called me up and said, I got my last tractor trailer load that went to Miami. We did well with them. So, um, you know, I'm trying to get a southern nursery involved, and Texas is one way, Saunders Brothers is another. Um, I got some help, some interest, but I wasn't quite sure what would happen, but uh, I'll call Bennett up at some point when we have both of these things and see if they want to license them, because I thought perhaps they're, they might be interested in licensing them for their Home Depot business, and if they can do that, if that's 50% of what they sell, um, then that would give them a reason to actually propagate it for southeastern orchards. And I'm really trying to breed for southeastern Pennsylvania down to North Georgia. OK, that was a good question. Thank you. Other questions?
All right, thanks a lot. Let's have ladies room.